Cypress Development Corp's flagship lithium project is located just east of Alba Marley's Silver Peak Mine in the heart of Clayton Valley, Nevada. A 12-hole exploration drill program for lithium-enriched claystone on Cypress's 100% controlled properties is now underway. Cypress Development Corp trades on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol CYP, the pink CYDVF, and on Frankfurt C1Z1. For more information, please visit our website, cypressdevelopmentcorp.com. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio, available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome to HowStreet.com Radio, the online source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is home ownership consultant Ross Kay from the wealthy homeowner.ca. Welcome back to the show, Ross. And thanks for having me back, Jim. NBC and Alberta panic stations over the NDP government and BC's proposal to put a speculation tax on properties in most parts of the province. And this has a lot of people upset. They own cabins or uh, recreational homes or even timeshares in parts of British Columbia. A lot of Albertans own recreational property in the Okanagan. And they are freaked out something fierce. They wonder if they're going to have to sell, if they're going to lose the cabin that they've held in their family for the last 40 years because they'll have to pay a 1% property tax every year because they don't live there full time. Do you think these concerns are legitimate and that governments tend to do some of these grandiose things without thinking how uh, perhaps tens of thousands of people, everyday people, could be affected? You're, you're, you're 100% correct. The people, the Canadians, who are having these feelings right now, these are true. These are not just feelings. This, this is reality. And this is why when we did the right to own policy, which we supplied to uh, David Eby o- over two years ago now, or almost two years ago now, that we took into this, a con- this con- consideration into account when we formulated the policy. They did not implement our policy fully. They pick and choose, I uh, chose some ideas, whether or not it came from the document we supplied Eby or not which has been posted on my website, which everybody have, has access to, or they came up with these things, I don't know. But when you listen to a bunch of academics and they give you guidance on policy, when those academics don't understand how it will interact with the home ownership market, you get consequences like this. When I heard this come out, Jim, I mean, in the province of Ontario, there are more dual ownership, home ownership, families in Ontario than there are in British Columbia, Canadians. There are more Canadian who owns more than one home in the province of Ontario, in this province, percentage-wise, than there is in British Columbia. Now, the Ontario government undertook a study about this a couple, I think it was last year sometime when they came up, and, and their numbers are a little skewed. But th- th- their numbers actually address what you're talking about. People own cabins, cottages, um, lodges, and uh, they also own, own investment properties. And those are Canadians. Now, the reason when we came up with the right to own policy, we targeted foreign owners was specifically for this reason. Because we don't believe that Canadians should be subject to the same um, rules as non-Canadians are. We also put a caveat in our right to own policy about free trade agreements because that was beyond the scope of our expertise. In other words, we were not going to take the days required for us to sort through each one of the trade agreements Canada has signed with other countries in order, order for us to be able to understand, first of all, could foreign owner, do they have the right to own Canadian homes through those, through those uh, trade agreements? B, are there loopholes that allow workarounds to take place in those trade agreements to allow foreign owners to own homes? And C, are there loopholes for the Canadian government as workarounds to prevent foreign owners for, from owning homes? You know, we're not paid for this. We did our right to own policy as a courtesy to the government because we knew that they didn't know what they were doing. Um, 
which has resulted in, in, in the policy that you have in place today. You also haven't heard a single person talk about free trade agreements and what limitations that puts on the federal government about ownership of Canadian real estate. I don't have the answer for that, Jim. I honestly do not have the answer, and nor does my company have time to spend uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars with doing the research to be able to give an honest and complete answer on that uh, on that question. My feeling is, based on my understanding when trade agreements have been signed in the, the past, specifically NAFTA, um, is that uh, Americans can own Canadian real estate, and there's nothing that you can do to stop it because of the trade agreement. Now, if that's the truth, then the governments need to come forward and tell Canadians our trade agreements are flawed, there's nothing we can do about it. We have to find another workaround. The workaround we came up with in British Columbia is also going to penalize Canadians. We're sorry, we're penalizing Canadians. Okay, we are now going to make adjustments in our tax policy on income tax or on uh, um, um, uh, tax credits, or in the amount of income, or the amount of uh, tax that you're going to pay, uh, as you'll be discounted that from. So the provincial land transfer tax is going to be discounted. Now, of course, the federal government is not going to agree to that, so it's, it's a complicated process. Long story short, they brought in a policy that wasn't vetted. They brought in what we would call a half-assed policy. It's a policy that is designed for a political uh, goal, which is votes. Keep the voters happy. It wasn't a rational decision policy that came about of understanding what the implications of the policy would have on Canadians. This policy will not impact affordability of homes in British Columbia under any circumstances. Your home prices, as we have said on your show for over a year now, are already going to record a 28% drop. There is no way of avoiding that. The government simply needed to allow that to take place. Because in British Columbia, it takes a lot longer for house price change, which has already appeared, to be recorded in sales data. Where in Ontario, it happens a lot quicker. The size of your housing market dictates how quick changes to the market show up in real estate sales statistics or CMHC statistics or economy, the statistics that the economists use. So in Ontario, the change, price change is rapidly recorded. And it's very understandable because everybody who, who owns a home can see that change taking place in their neighborhood. In British Columbia, specifically Vancouver, you don't see that. You see that the better quality homes are still selling. You don't realize that the junk two streets over sold for a 20 or 30 or 40 percent reduction. In Ontario, people see that because you don't have, the junk doesn't have to sell. You can jump up two or three stages from the junk and if those houses um, are no, are not selling, you realize there's something wrong with your own house. Your own house price is changing. The BC government brought this policy in preventing Canadians from owning a second home. It was ludicrous the day that it came out. You do not tell a family who has worked their entire lives to not only afford their own home, but to purchase a uh, summer property or a vacation property in the province that they live in, which has been their legal right since Canada became a country, that you are going to tax them on that second home. This is not a wealth tax because a lot of these, these properties are, are owned jointly by families where two, are, where the kids and the parents all share joint ownership of that property. They're going to be taxed on it. They're already paying 
property taxes on their existing property. They're already paying British Columbia income taxes to British Columbia. They're already paying um, a sales tax on anything that they buy, GST on anything that they buy. They're already taxed to death. And now you're going to say, of the 20 years your family has spent with, the, with your vacation property, which we have never cared about for your lifetime or your parents' lifetime before you or your grandparents' lifetime before you or your great-grandparents' lifetime before you, we're going to tax you. And not only are we going to tax you, we're going to tax you because we want the taxes, not because it's going to improve affordability. Affordability for, for home buyers is not the same as affordable housing. Affordable housing means affordable rentals, rentals tied to income. Subsidized housing is not, has nothing to do with home ownership. Subsidized housing is rental accommodation subsidized by the government. The public sector can build affordable housing. It's very easy to do in 20, in the, for, I guess from about 2008 onwards, it's been extremely easy and profitable for private corporations to, to build affordable housing. Had the governments been, um, informed enough to establish land zoning policies in their municipalities to encourage that to be done. They didn't do it. That was their opportunity missed. Um, subsidized housing means that you've got to give someone, uh, they don't make enough income to be able to cover their rent, so the government has decided we're, we're, we're going to help you out. All of the taxpayers in the province are going to help you with your rental property. That's got nothing to do with ownership. Ownership is affordable ownership can only be done in a couple of ways. One is to build a whole bunch of houses out in your suburbs and supply transit that makes those houses attractive for young couples to buy. It certainly isn't by adding density, and it certainly isn't at by making ha uh, condominiums smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller so you can charge less and less and less and less. Sure, let the land get flipped 20 times. Let the price of the land build up 3, 4, 5, 600% over what it originally sold for. Then let the builders grab astronomical profit margins on the property and then let the building community lobby the government to get any changes that they want. And that's why you have the problem with affordability. Interest rates are going to take care of affordability, folks. Your affordability issue is, is, is rapidly coming home to roost right now. This policy the government brought in is simply a tax on Canadians. Nothing more, nothing less. Their numbers, if you looked at the number of uh, vacant homes, the vacant home tax in Vancouver, extremely percentage-wise, I think it was like 1.2% of homes were vacant. I can tell you in my city of Burlington, Jim, right now, more than 1.2% of the homes are vacant, and they always have been. That's just the way, that's just the way that your housing stock has to be improved. There's always homes that are vacant, being torn down, renovated. That's, you, you need that if you're going to have affordable housing, if you're going to have housing stock that people can move through. What you're, what's happening in British Columbia over this tax was simply an uneducated, ignorant political class in your province who acted irrationally, I encourage any of your listeners to seek out the education level and the training of these people in political positions making these decisions for you. Find out where they're getting their advice from. They, they have none, folks. They, there is, it, it, is, it is lunacy. It's, it's, it's just crazy. So uh, your housing problem with this tax, these pe this is real for these people. They're being taxed for no reason at all. I don't personally believe it's even constitutional, to be quite honest with you. I'm surprised that a, a, a lawyer's group has not got together to challenge this. I do not believe the government can penalize you from owning two, if you're a Canadian, from owning two, two homes. But again, my firm can't afford to investigate that. We don't have the hundreds of thousands of dollars at our disposal that we can afford to set our time aside 
and uh, do that type of research. We can tell somebody, hey, you guys better get out and do this research and find out if this is true or not. I believe what the government has done, I, I believe it's it's not constitutional. I think they have singled out a certain class of Canadians, and it's Canadians who uh, have uh, chosen to own a uh, recreational property, and I don't believe that that is even legal in this country. We'll have more with Ross K. right after the break. MGX Minerals is revolutionizing the new energy economy with patented lithium extraction technology replacing traditional solar evaporation using low-cost, low-energy nanofiltration. The first system of this paradigm shift technology is currently being commissioned. MGX Minerals trades on the CSE, symbol XMG, the OTCQB, symbol MGXMF, and Frankfurt, symbol 1MG. For more information, visit our website, mgxminerals.com. Hi, I'm Douglas Mason, President and CEO of Rainy Mountain Royalty Corp, RMO on the TSX Venture Exchange. Rainy Mountain's Brunswick property is located in the Ridout Shear Zone in Ontario, with grab samples running as high as 32 grams per ton gold. A follow-up drill program to test numerous targets located by recent groundwork is planned for early 2018. Please visit our website at rmroyalty.com. Welcome back. We're chatting with Ross K. Ross, last week we learned that a previously secret document from the Department of Finance about household debt to income ratios revealed the ministry has no idea of knowing what constitutes risky debt to income levels in Canada. That was on the heels of ratings agencies warning that Canada's ratio of debt to income was way too high. Now you've commented here in the past about how the ratio was misread and misunderstood by everyone. Were you just proven right? Yeah, I guess, yes, we were just proven right. But, I mean, what's what's uh, tragic about that one, uh, Jim, is that the term secret document uh, actually ap- appeared in the uh, the press releases um from the reporters that that were covering this uh, situation, supposedly, uh, the Minister of Finance or the Department of Finance uh, had in their possession a document that they kept secret from the Canadian public, talking about debt to income ratios. And what the document said was, the the government lacks the ability to comment on debt to income ratios what is it what would be an acceptable ratio what would not be an acceptable ratio the document said the government lacked the ability to comment on that ironically all of the rating agencies who have downgraded Canada's credit at over the last uh, two years um, they have always referenced this uh, metric and we've been on, I know we have been on your show. People could go back and listen to the old shows where we talk about debt to income ratio not being a metric, a usable metric, um, in a historical comparison. So you can't use the debt to income ratio in 2017, 2018 and be comparing it to 2000, uh, 1990 or, or, or 1980. You can't use that metric. If we were to do that with the homeowners that uh, that that uh, we help out, or, or the home buyers that we help out, you know, we would not have a we would not have a career. There would be there would there would be no need for our platform because it would be cra- it would be stupid, like literally. Um, your debt to income ratio. The reason the government doesn't understand it. The reason the economists don't know what debt to income ratio is actually safe. And which one is dangerous is the debt to income ratio changes. You can't say that a 100% debt to income ratio, this is a national number, folks. So this is not the same thing we'd be talking about if we're talking about you going out and buying a house. You can't say in 1990, 100% debt to service or 90% debt to service ratio is okay. And then in 2017, that 165 debt to service ratio, um, income to, uh, debt ratio is, uh, is, um, is wrong. You can't use that metric. You have to be adjusting the debt 
to income ratio with interest rates. You have to be adjusting it between household, the amount of household credit that is going to service mortgage debt and that that's going to service cars and that's what's going to service credit card loans. You have to separate these things. And then when you aggregate the, the proper terms of risk on each of those components, you can come up with an aggregate met metric that uh, measures risk. And this is all possible with Statistics Canada data. So it's not like I have information here that the government doesn't have access to. As I've said to your listeners here in the, in the past, the reason why we analyze things differently is we take their data and we know what to do with it in terms of how homeowners interact with their homes and their lives. We know it. We know how it works. Homeowners drive 75% of the Canadian economy. That is the truth. It's inarguable. Or excuse me, your, your households. Your households drive uh, the economy. And then we know that 70% of that uh, is driven by homeowners. So homeowners are driving more than 50% of the, the economy. What this, what this, what this revealed to your listeners, which would have, should have been on the breaking news on every newscast but on, over the entire, um, last three or four days was that the government of Canada is using a metric that they didn't know how to interpret. They still don't know how to interpret it. The ratings industries which, which downgraded our credit, which makes us pay higher interest rates, don't know how to use it either. They're comparing Canada in 2017 to Canada in 1990. And you can't do that. As we've said on your show over and over again, Canadian homeowners are awesome savers. Canadian homeowners don't lose their homes. Canadian homeowners are not Americans. Canadian homeowners are not um, uh, living in Britain. Canadian homeowners are not living in Australia. Canadian homeowners live in Canada. We frame it this way, Jim. The homeownership situation or decision is in a sandbox. And this sandbox, this is a, a term used from the video game industry, the sandbox establishes the rules of the game. When you get into that sandbox, you can't get out. The sandbox limits the rules of the game. When you get up, when you go to a certain part in the sandbox, nothing, you can't go any further. It's like on a, on a, on a, on a, uh, um, TV screen. You can only go to the edge of the TV screen and you can't go any further. There's nothing there. The sandbox is the same way. If the government looked at income to debt ratios the way that we look at it from our homeowner's perspective in the sandbox, sandbox that they're operating on in, knowing that that sandbox changes with every single change of interest rate that takes place. It changes with every single change in income tax the government makes. It changes with the T, when the TFSAs came in. It changed. When the RSP rules, it changed. When British, if you lived in British Columbia, when they brought in that thirty-seven thousand uh, dollar, fifteen-year interest-free loan, it changed your sandbox, and that sandbox changed all of the outcomes of the metrics that they're trying to use to measure it. It's why your benchmark price doesn't work. It's why the twenty-eight percent house price. Uh, a negative price uh, that we recorded over a year ago is, is, is real. You just don't know it because the government in British Columbia gave somebody $37,000 to buy a $37,000 more expensive home. That $37,000 got converted into uh, four times that amount. It got converted into, what's that, 120 and uh, $20, $148,000. Now, if you take two sales and you take the average, it's about, what, uh, 80000 Well, gee, go back and check up what your condominium prices went up in the last year, folks, since that, uh, since that $37,000 uh, interest-free loan was given out. Go back and check. 
I'll bet you it's going to be, on average, pretty close to $85,000. It's, it's going to be pretty close. We know how the market works. We know what's going to happen with prices before it happens. Not because we're, we have a crystal ball, simply because we know the sandbox. How, what the rules of the sandbox are, if you add some extra sand in or you take some out, what change that is going to make to which, what games you can play in the sandbox. And we know what's going on. The government has just admitted with a secret document, secret, secret, like this is conspiracy theory stuff, secret document, they don't even understand debt to income ratio. They don't even understand it. Ross? Yet they're setting policies, they're setting tax rules, they're setting budgets and deficits, they're making all of these rules without knowing. The world's economists don't understand this simple truth about home ownership. They don't understand how debt and income work. And it's absurd. And it was really absurd until this report came out. When it was, and any of your listeners can go check, this is not a conspiracy theory. Check. Uh, go out and Google, uh, debt to income ratio, and you'll see all the newspaper articles. And you've got a question, why has it been buried? Why has this been buried over the last couple of days? Why was this not making headline news on every major news station in the country? Why? Ross, I'll tell you why. Because they laid off and retired all the experienced reporters who know when they see something that stinks. They have a bunch of inexperienced kids who work hard but have no idea what they're looking at. And they accept government news releases at face value and don't ask any questions. Uh, there's one or two young reporters here in town who are, are good at asking questions. But the rest just spout whatever the last news release said. They don't find out, is it accurate? Is it true? Why should we be concerned about this? Or there, is there anybody who cares about it? Uh, they do only now on your local news what I call fuzz and was, fires and police reports. That's it. It's very rare now to see any kind of investigation into anything. They just take a news release. They go out and get some pictures that go along with the news release, and they report it as news. We'll have more with Ross K. right after this. Avon Resources Limited is a gold exploration company with significant projects in British Columbia, Saskatchewan, and the Yukon. Trading on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol ABN, and the pink symbol ABN AF. Surrounded by world-class gold deposits and mines, Avon's 23,000 hectares Forest Kerr Gold Project is located in the heart of the Golden Triangle in northwestern BC. For more information, visit us at avonresources.com. Don't miss out. Stay informed. Receive the HowStreet.com weekly recap with thought-provoking podcasts, radio, and articles delivered to your inbox. Sign up for the HowStreet.com weekly recap on our homepage at HowStreet.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Ross K. Since the last show, Terranet National Bank and the Canadian Real Estate Association both released their February statistics and they both suggested the markets would get better later this year. They were blaming today's slowdown over all the new rules that have been put into place for new mortgages. What do you think of those news releases, and will the real estate market get better? Okay, so this is how real estate stats work, and this is what your listeners need to know. It's been a long time since I've had a chance to be able to... Uh, to say something here in the show, knowing that it would be, it's going to get an immediate, uh, verification ability, um, the ability to, to ver verify it, uh, relatively quickly. Because the cycle has changed and because that is when, oh, that is when you get to, to see how it works. If you go up on the size of, side of a mountain, Jim, and you go over the, you go over the peak and you start coming back down the, the other side, you you cross a time you, you you reach a time where you, where you would have passed yourself on the other side. So in other words, once that little peak is taken off, because it, it it happens really quick, the peak, it takes longer um, as you go down the mountain to to match up where you would have been on the other side. It's just because that's the shape of a mountain. It's 
you know, it's like a pyramid. Uh, oh, gee, that's a coincidence. <laughs> um, and that's how real estate stats go. Because it's a cycle, real estate is bought and sold in cycles. Um, normally, those cycles only last for a, a couple of years. But this last cycle we were in was, was a record setting, never before in history, uh, cycle that lasted over four years. So all, so any comparison over the last fours, four years was not possible with normal real estate stats, normal housing metrics. You, you couldn't use them because that was a brand new sandbox like we talked about in the other show. It, it, it was a brand new set of rules. If you didn't know how to measure while you were going up the hill, you didn't get it. You didn't get a breather. You didn't get a, a respite because because you started to come back down again. No, no, no. This mountain just you just kept going up this mountain. This mountain just kept getting pushed large, taller and taller and taller and taller. And it lasted. The sat cycle lasted so long that it apparently the new reporters. You you were mentioning about reporters. The new economists they 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 haven't got a chance here. To, to understand how the market works. Well, what the Canadian Real Estate Association is saying, what National Bank is saying, in, in order to cover up for their incompetence over the last five years, um, is that uh, well, things are going to get better in the second, third, in the third or fourth quarter of this year. Well, of course, it's going to look like it's getting better because you're further down the mountain on the other side, and change isn't going to be recorded as quickly because you're comparing it against a year ago stat. Now, what they've do already done, they have done this quickly, Jim, two months. They are now talking about comparing it to 2016. They're no longer talking about 2017 comparisons. Oh, no, no, no. Just forget about 2017. We don't want anybody to think about 2017 because... Uh, over 500,000 Canadians went out and purchased a home with a realtor and we gave them the wrong advice. Let's forget about 2017. Uh, Let's jump back to 2016. Let, oh, things are still better than 2016. Well, that's because you've gone down the mountain back to 26, where you were in 2016. What we're going to hear next is, let's go back to 2015. That's what's next. Or the 10-year average. Or, oh, well, you're still better off than you were five years ago. All of these standard sales techniques, standard salesman talk that are in the stats start to be repeated. And that's what you've heard. What your listeners need to understand is this. Year-over-year -year comparisons as you go down the other side of the mountain don't sound that bad. A one thousand dollar drop at the as you crested the peak of the mountain, or a one thousand dollar drop as you get near the bottom of the mountain is still a one thousand dollar drop. When you're looking to compare it with real estate stats in year over year, once the twelve months crosses over, then it never sounds as bad. And each 12 months, as you go forward, it keeps sounding not as bad. Right up until the 11th month, it gets, it's getting really bad. Then in the 12th month, oh, it's not as bad as we thought it was going to be. And that re pattern repeats itself over and over again as long as you're going down the mountain. Normally, the mountain only lasts about two years. By two years, you get to the top of the mountain, you start coming down the other side. So those year-over-year -year comparisons really don't start to apply. You don't see the magnitude of house price gain or change. You don't see the magnitude of sales swinging from one to the other. But when the mountain goes, if the mountain goes down for four years, that's when you have your major problem. If you're not reading metrics in the housing market that explain to you what, where the price is going to be as you're going up the mountain and going down the mountain, then you are going to have yourselves a financially constrained life. Your listeners are going to be 
financially limited if they believe these real estate stats. House price change that you're going to be seeing over the next 12 months has already taken place. That house price change is done. There is no way that the Canadian Real Estate Association can reverse it. Now, if the government drops interest rates 2%, which we, in today's case now, would it, we'd be back down to zero or below zero uh, in order to make that happen with interest rates, mortgage interest rates, um, then they could change it and at the end of a year, may, maybe it wouldn't look as bad. But there's nothing on the horizon, folks, that are gonna, that is going to do that. What we have to be looking at when you're talking about buying a home and when you're talking about owning a home and actually if you're thinking about cashing out your home is what is the long-term consequence of a 10, 15, 20-year rising interest rate cycle? What are the consequences to your net wealth tied up in the family home because of that rising interest rate cycle? We know what the consequences are, so we're able to forecast. When you know that, you can take proactive measures to make sure that your family's not financially um, harmed because you didn't know what was going to go on. And you wake up 20 years from now saying, oh, my house price didn't go up the same way that my parents, uh, it went up for my parents. Well, of course it can't go up. Interest rates are rising for the lifetime you've owned your home. Interest rates fell for the lifetime your parents owned. You need to make those gains early where your parents got to make the gains at the end. It's all a cycle. It all works out. It only doesn't work out when people don't understand how the housing market works. Don't believe organized real estate about when they start to say that year-over-year -year changes aren't as bad. Remember you heard that in Vancouver, Jim. Oh, you know, at first it was the prices were, were dropping uh, 15, 15, 78, 20%. Then the next, within a couple months, you didn't hear about it anymore. That's because the market had really rolled over months before you heard about a rolling over, and then the year-over-year -year comparisons didn't look as bad as that they, that they looked at, that, that, uh, because, because you were looking at an older market. We measured the market. The word from what is happening today, which means the activities took place a year ago that are dictating the market today. Going forward, it's exactly the same thing. We're recording uh, market measurements today, which will be reported in real estate stats a year from now. It's why forecasting real estate is really, really simple. It's why timing the market is really, really simple. It's why you don't believe the Canadian Real Estate Association when they tell you in the third quarter the market is going to start to uh, equalize or get better. Yeah, so everything's going to get better. But when you're still losing the exact same $1,000 that you had lost at the peak of the mountain, it's really no better in your pocketbook. Ross, thank you so much for chatting with us. Hey, thanks a lot, Jim. My guest has been home ownership consultant Ross K from the wealthyhomeowner.ca. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio. Find us on Twitter at HowStreet. Our popular YouTube channel is Talk Digital Network. Questions for the show or for Ross can be sent to info at HowStreet.com. I'm Jim Goddard. Thanks for listening. Comments made on HowStreet.com Radio are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any matter whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. HowStreet.com Radio is a production of HowStreet Media Incorporated.